Good evening and welcome to the Grace Talk. Today is the beginning of our September to Remember business and leadership shows. Throughout the month of September, every Sunday, we would bring you business leaders who have achieved tremendous success in executive positions in corporate America. Our goal is to equip you and to help you to grow personally, professionally, and financially. I encourage you to take advantage of these amazing individuals and their mentoring. They're going to be here to mentor you. Take advantage of that. Ask questions, connect with them, and again, they will be here to answer your questions. Now, to kick off our show today and this series is my mentor and friend, Joe Rigby. I have known Joe for over you know, 14 years. Joe Rigby served as the chairman of the board, the president and chief executive officer of Pepco Holdings, Inc. PHI is a company that delivers electricity and energy actually to four states, including our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Joe, welcome to our show. Oh, thank you for having me. I was looking forward to uh, spending some time with you. I appreciate that. Now, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Introduce sure, yourself. Sure, sure. I was, uh, I was born and raised in southern New Jersey. Um, I was one of seven kids. Uh, uh, went to work on a farm when I was 10. Uh, uh, probably the most significant thing that ever happened to me in my life occurred when I was 16 because I, I met the, uh, the girl, now the woman, who I'll be married to for 40 years next year. And uh, went to Rutgers in Camden, got my undergraduate degree. Uh, went to work <clears throat> as a junior accountant at Atlantic City Electric in 1979. I have two kids, they're 37 and 35, and I have two uh, wonderful granddaughters who are five and two. So uh, that's everything you need to know about me. And his granddaughter, you guys should see this beautiful girl. She has the most wonderful blue eyes <laughs> yeah. that you ever saw. And by the way, Carol, if you're watching us, <laughs> hi. Carol is Joe's rock. Yes. And has been throughout his career. Knowing Joe personally, I know how much Carol meant at every step mm -hmm. of the way. Right. And Carol, we thank you because I wouldn't have got to know the <laughs> man that Joe is except for you and your support. So thank you so much. So now, Joe, tell us how are you sitting here talking about being a CEO? What is your journey sure. from a farm boy sure. to corporate America? Well, uh, well, first, I, I never thought I would be a CEO. I, it, was not a, it was not a career aspiration. I, don't, I, I, I think maybe some people may say, well, I always wanted to be a CEO. I really wasn't what, what I had aspired to do. And uh, I think when I reflect on the, well, I, was, I, I worked for over 37 years at, and went through several mergers. Um, I think when I reflect on things, um, first off, I, I had a lot of people who took interest in me, who, who provided me the benefit of their wisdom, uh, gave me opportunities. But I, I think in some ways, um, the pathway that led me to, to you know, ultimately becoming the CEO was uh, I was willing to take some risks and, and maybe take some strange career turns that you know, a, a, an accountant wouldn't otherwise take. So I think one of the things that I've learned is that if, if someone is offering you an opportunity, even if you feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you, you really want to think about maybe, maybe taking advantage of that because they believe in you mm -hmm. and they're not going to risk their own personal reputation. Um, so I, I, I was very, very fortunate. I, I can think of several times in my career where almost out of the blue, I had an opportunity come my way. And, and I, you know, I think the other thing that was important was to never look to the next job. Just do the best you can, learn as much as you can, um, and, and ultimately, opportunities do come. You know, you've been wildly successful yourself. So um, I, I think, um, you know, that, like I said, I never thought about it until I actually became the chief financial officer of the company. That, that perhaps I could become a CEO. So if you're listening to us today, the first thing you're hearing Joe tell you is 
your current job is your most important job. Correct. Make sure you're doing your job that you're doing now well and not just trying to get ahead. Do your job well and opportunities will open up for you. And if you're joining us right now, we are on set talking to Joe Rigby, Chairman of the Board, President and CEO of Pepco Holdings, Inc. Retired. Retired. <laughs> Retired. So, Joe, let me ask you a question. During the time of your leadership, there were many things that happened with the company. Mm. So tell me, what were the challenges that you faced as a CEO and how did you overcome them? Well, um, I, I, was, uh, I was chairman and CEO for uh, just a little over seven years. And I would, I would probably tell you that I would almost like uh, there were almost like two very different halves of a career the first part of it uh, right after I became CEO um, we became aware that uh, we were facing both an earnings and a liquidity challenge and um, I had to go to the board and tell them that we were not going to earn our dividend and 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 you well know this because you you live through this with me but we had to make some tough decisions around the kind of the businesses we could legitimately be in and continue to invest and um, we made a hard call I think it was in hindsight the right call uh, to exit the generation business uh, to focus on the wires business and then everything broke loose in the summer of 2010 when we had some severe storms come through Washington DC we had an enormous amount of outages, not unlike what you're seeing with Hurricane Florence down in North Carolina, unfortunately. Uh, but the core of our issue was was candidly a, a, a real weakness in our in our in, in our infrastructure, and that led to a tremendous amount of uh, criticism to the company. Uh, I, I recall maybe six or seven months into that problem. Uh, Finding out that we were hated, we were named the most hated company in America. Which, as a CEO, is not something you really aspire to. Um, but it, but it, it, you know, which I thought was kind of an extreme comment, obviously. But, but a lot of the criticism that came our way was deserved. And um, you know, so we spent a good two, two and a half years, really just hunkering down, making as many improvements as we could make in the infrastructure. And lo and behold, and this is kind of a, a maybe way more than you want to know, but uh, it actually took a storm to get us out of the issue, because we could we could trumpet all of the improvements we made, but until the our customers, particularly down in the D.C. area, saw evidence of it, um, it was just a lot of words from from us. And when Hurricane Sandy came through, uh, the company performed very very well, and that was a real turning point where um, even though we were still I'd say we were in the bad kids' chair in the eyes of the regulators, uh, particularly in Maryland and, and D.C., that things felt differently. I felt, I felt that even internally that, that there was a tremendous amount of pride within the workforce that we had first faced a problem, we admitted it, we owned it, and then we fixed it. And, um, and then beyond that, um, uh, I, I knew that the likely path or a likely path for us going forward would be once we had had cleaned the company up, if you will, that we were going to look attractive to an acquirer, and that's that's what happened in in the beginning of 2014. Uh, Exelon Corporation, headquartered in uh, Chicago, uh, the CEO got a hold of me and and you know put a proposal in front of us and ultimately in front of our board that was such a strong deal, and I and I felt it was it was going to make not just to provide a a handsome return to our investors, but actually position the company to be stronger in serving our customers going forward. So, you know, that that's a kind of a quick range of all the things that took place in uh, just a little over seven years. <laughs> no, it's amazing. And folks, I can tell you a lot of this, like Joe indicated, I was right there. I was one of the executives, you know, you know, alongside with him as we beheld this. And I can tell you a couple of things that struck me. Joe is one of these, a very modest guy, but he is one of the most humble leaders that I have ever met and um, Joe is very uh, he doesn't take himself too seriously he has a great sense of humor and through it all it was one of the hardest times of your life oh, but you were able to lead the company through incredible times that were just horrific 
times for us mm -hmm. as executives, as leaders, and, and for employees. Right. Now, one of the things that Joe Dot did, and he didn't know how much this impacted me, and I'm going to tell on you right now, was <laughs> we were before one of the state commissions, and it was really tough, and it was so hard. And he chose to take accountability for the problems of the company, even though many of those problems, he inherited the problems. And he took responsibility for that, and he said, I'm going to forgo my bonus. For me, that was, that was a crystal clear moment of leadership. So talk to me about leadership courage, because I saw you model that for me. Many of the times that we went through, when we were the most hated company in America, who could, who? <laughs> that was a terrible time. And when our stock right. was $10, I distinctly remember the day when our stock was $10. Talk to us about leadership courage, Joe. Well, you know, you, you find yourself in these moments in your life, and, and you find the challenges, and you know, one of the things I realized going into the job that that there were going to be moments. I was not surprised that there were moments because you just know it's coming. But I understood that there were going to be times when um, I would be tested. And, uh, you know, I never wanted to be in a position where I would look back with regret around an action I took or I didn't take. And I, I, I always felt that if you didn't step up and do the right thing, do the hard thing, then you might avoid the issue in that moment but you really wouldn't like, you wouldn't like yourself that much. So for me, that was always kind of the backstop of like why I felt we needed to do or take some tough action was because I didn't want to have to look back and have a regret that I had missed an opportunity to do the right thing. And, and I, I think that, um, at least in my life, and it was a, a lesson that my parents taught me was it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. That's right. And, 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 where I think companies get into into trouble and where individual leaders get into trouble is when they veer away from integrity, from their own personal integrity. And, um, you know, it, it does. It, it, there's times when it's, when it's uh, you're, you know, your, your stomach is in knots. And, uh, but you can, you can know in your heart and your gut that, you know, what, what the right thing is to do. Absolutely. And we're looking to connect with our, our audience in a, in a little bit. So now, another thing that I saw you model for me was, you know, grace under fire. That I, is one I was of making those, it up as I was going along. <laughs> that is one of those tough leadership moments where it's either you're a leader or you're not. You know, mm -hmm. going into your leadership role, you did not anticipate that, you know, this was going to happen, all this, everything coming at you at once. No. But being able to stand tall as a leader in that moment and to be graceful in that moment and not either blame, you know, other people shift blame, mm -hmm. but take accountability. Talk to us about grace on the fire. Well, well, that's, you're, you're very generous in saying that. I, I have to tell you that when, when things were really tough, I never felt alone. I mean, some, sometimes you just, well, it's lonely at the top. And there are things that only you in that position can uniquely there only you have to make that decision but i never felt alone i mean i would be able to come into a meeting and see you and 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 i would know that i've got really smart talented dedicated people around me and and i think this was kind of a lesson for me anyway in the notion of diversity is you know diversity in all its different dimensions whether it's race gender you know all all the you know different different experiences thought I always thought that the greatest uh, kind of example of diversity was that if we all kind of just uh, brought our best thinking to it, different thinking to it, the answer was always in the room. I always felt, I never felt, or very very rarely did I feel like I needed to kind of make, make the decision or come up with the answer because there was always a lot of smart people in the room. So I never felt really alone as, you know, we were going on this journey. And, you know, you, you face enough things in your life, in your personal life, and, you know, you lose parents, you, you, you know, loved ones. You realize that this, this too shall pass. You know, it's important, and it feels immensely important when it's happening, but 
try to step back and think that, well, you know what, uh, we're going to be okay. We'll, we'll come through this. It's going to hurt, maybe, but you'll get on the other side of it. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that happens when you become a CEO at your level is that really you uh, begin to interact and lead people who, in many of the specific areas of detail and technical areas, they are more knowledgeable than you are. Oh, yeah. So talk to us, and one of the things that I really enjoyed was that you were a leader who was not insecure. <laughs> you were a leader who was not insecure, and I was watching you, and again, the good thing is, I knew you going in, I knew you before you were a CEO. You were my mentor before right. you became a CEO, right. and I watched that transition for you. Talk to us about that, because sometimes that insecurity becomes a barrier to a leader. Right. Talk to us about that. Well, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is when uh, Delmarva Power bought Atlantic Electric, right after that merger, I became the head of the gas business. And other than having bought gas for my car, I, I didn't have any gas delivery experience. I mean, Atlantic Electric did not have a gas business. So I show up, I'm the vice president of gas, and I'm surrounded by these vet veterans of 30 plus years. And, and if I had tried to act like I knew more than I did, it would have been painfully obvious. So let's just accept the fact that I don't know that much about that, but there are other things that perhaps I can be helpful in. And, and my, my view was I was never going to try to tell an engineer how to engineer, you know, and, um, and I think in that regard, I, I think you end up getting some respect and credibility because you're not trying to portray yourself as something that you're not. And, and and, you know, I, I would find that, um, you know, with in a relatively short period of time, you could find your niche of how you could help that team, round that team out. And that was, you know, when I took over the electric business. Again, I was not an electrical engineer, but I was able to find my place. And, and people people do look for leadership. They're, they're, they want, and I also felt, I was very fortunate throughout my career, I always felt the sense that people wanted me to be successful. They wanted us as a business to be successful. So as long as I didn't, you know, position myself in any kind of a high and mighty manner and make fun of myself and feel have people feel comfortable being who they are, then I, I could fit into whatever team I needed to fit into. Okay, let's touch in with our audience and ask you some questions. Sure. Um, Aside, how, first, how did you find mentors that helped you? Were there any mentors that helped you grow as a, a leader? Sure. I had several, and, and I still have people that I look up to and, and reach out to to get advice. I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a fool's iron to think you're ever at a point where you, don't, you wouldn't benefit from some input. So I, I'm on two corporate boards, and I, I, I use my colleagues to try to help me understand and you know, kind of even monitor my own behavior in, in a board meeting to make sure I'm the best board member I can be. Um, I think it's natural when you first, when you're, you're, your first series of jobs, your, your supervisor, your direct supervisor is in fact a mentor. Um, I think as you build, and I think it's very important to be deliberate about building a network of, of people in your organization. Seek out people that, that you believe can, can help you learn the ropes. And, and I think most importantly, be honest with you. Tell you when you, eh, that wasn't maybe the best way of doing that. That, that I think that's really where the goal is in a, in a mentoring relationship is when you, you, you establish such a trust with the other person that they feel comfortable telling you when there's, maybe you can adjust the dials and become a little better. Um, but uh, there were, uh, I, I can remember uh, it, a, a gentleman you and I both know, a guy by the name of Tom Shaw, who took a, took an interest in me uh, when I went to work at Connective. Uh, Tom was from Delmarva Power. And from very early on, um, even though I ended up working for him, I, I, as much as he was my supervisor, I always still felt he was my mentor. And I could feel his hand on my shoulder at times as I was trying to navigate things. So. so I, I think it's I, I think the important thing that I, I'd offer is that you, you, you should never feel that you're past that that need. That is awesome. And by the way, um, what Joe was saying, he is that to me. <laughs> He's been able to look me in the eye and tell me some things. 
I have grown in trust towards him and he's been able to, you know, help me navigate my career and sometimes look at me and tell me some tough things, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. The last time we, we, we <laughs> had a leadership <laughs> lunch, you know, it's like, Gloria, calm down. You have achieved tremendous success, you know. Be able to sit down and enjoy your success. You told me that. Well, I never I thought you seriously. listened to me. I never had a sense you ever listened to anything I said. I do listen. <laughs> so I can tell you he's absolutely um, correct. Having a trust relationship with a mentor is extremely um, important. Another question is, aside from mentors, who helped you develop and understand your leadership uh, qualities or help grow? Your leadership qualities. Well, you know, I um, I'll, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, in the mid '90s, when I was at Atlantic Electric, we went through a whole. The, the industry at large was dealing with the whole notions of deregulation, and the company was in a, a phase where it needed to kind of reinvent itself. And uh, I got a phone call one day to come up to the CEO's office, and he told me I was going to be the project manager of Atlantic Transformation, and I didn't have a clue what that meant. Um, and it was mostly going to be re-engineering, but in concert with that, we were going to um, work on our culture. And I had no sense of that at all. I mean, I had been kind of a numbers guy up to that point. But I intersected. We, we, had, we retained a, a fairly avant-garde consultant in terms of business culture you know, transformation. And I intersected with her. And I, I learned a lot in terms of being able to understand where people are, to be able to to, to, to kind of read their mood, to, to, to understand, um, almost to, in some ways, I know this may seem a little out there, but to try to tap into the energy that's in the room, to be aware of what that energy mm -hmm. is. And never to manipulate it or take advantage of it, mm -hmm. but, but to, and I felt that she always had a comment about, you know, trying to, center yourself emotionally because people can't people will follow you if you mm -hmm. feel if they sense that you yourself were emotionally centered mm -hmm. and that has very little in my opinion anyway very very little to do with uh, technical knowledge mm -hmm. it, it has it, it's it's in some ways coming to grips with yourself of your own weaknesses mm -hmm. and feeling that it's not vulnerable to be at times unsure and people can sense your humanity and and I think People that try to portray themselves as all-knowing, you know, they, we all see through that. Mm -hmm. But that that was kind of a lesson I learned um, in hopefully becoming somebody that uh, people would trust and, and ultimately follow. Joe has said some very important things, and I want to reinforce those. First is you're saying be self-aware. You know, be self-aware. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a room, kind of center yourself. Mm -hmm. Because people take their cues from you as a leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's, that's a very important thing to note um, there. Um, we will go back to our audience. We have more questions from the audience. What were some of the early mistakes that you made in your career? I never made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question. Uh, oh, geez. I, uh, I can remember... Uh, I was probably working for less than a year, and I and I tried to bid out of the department I was in. I actually went to get another, tried to get another job, and and that kind of comes to mind very quickly. Of of, I had not stayed in a job long enough to leave that job. You know, like I think, it, it's it's. I don't think my own personal opinion is that people who get in a get a, a you know a reputation of job hopping, I don't think that's a good thing to do. And. And so that was a mistake. And fortunately, I didn't get the job, but I got a serious talking to of the impression that left mm. with the people that had just hired me a year before. Mm. Not a, not a, I, obviously I dodged, you know, whatever bullet that was, but it always struck me. And, and to be honest with you, that was the last job I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I, ne I never tried it again. Um, I can remember, um, being in a situation where, um, I'm trying to think how to say it. we, I was banging heads with somebody, and um, I I found myself, I knew I was right, and I don't, I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but I knew, and, and I felt myself kind of backtracking because I was afraid of the confrontation, mm -hmm. and you know this, that if you're, if, if you're the leader, if you're expected to deliver on results, and 
you have to lean in on something that could be un unpleasant or uncomfortable. If you back away from it, it's just going to make the next time even that harder. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there are just two things that come to mind quickly on that. Thank you, and you also lose credibility with yeah. those who are following exactly. you. Exactly, right? Because they, because they, 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 they see that. Leadership. Yes. Yeah. So that is amazing. We actually found that he made some mistakes. Wow. <laughs> and you they they up, were the only two I ever made. <laughs> and you ended up staying in this job for 37 years. 37 years. Yeah, I, I survived uh, two mergers. So it was really good that you did not leave. Look at you now. You were able to go yeah. all the way up to the, uh, become CEO of PHI. Um, another question is, um, knowing what you know now, what would you change in your journey? Is there anything that you would change? Yeah, you know, um, as much as, you know, I, I, I said earlier that I always felt that I was supported, I, uh, I guess I'd say two things. One is that um, I, I worried too much. I, I found that, you know, I lost a lot of sleep that in hindsight I probably didn't need because I was, I was so worried about how things were going to play out. And, and I think, not that I think I ever got to a point where I wasn't taking care of myself, but I could easily see how that could have happened. And, and I, I kind of wish that I had maybe, I also wish I maybe had enjoyed things a little bit more. Relax you know, a little kind of, bit more? Well, let me maybe the notion of maybe smelling the roses a little bit. Uh, the last year and a half I worked, which you know was kind of at the time where the merger had been announced, I was able to maybe step back and reflect a little bit and, and kind of enjoy the sense that that my team had, we were going, I felt that we were gonna leave the place better than we had inherited it. And I wish I had maybe been a little bit more um, aware and appreciative of the good things that were happening around me versus always worrying about, you know, some catastrophe that could happen, so. Uh, if you're joining us today, we are on set talking to Chairman, of the board <laughs> retired <laughs> retired president and chief executive officer of pepco holdings inc retired joe rigby now joe a quick question for you I have one more question we'll probably go to our audience one more time and then we can um oh you have many questions it looks like we're gonna have to bring him back because we're getting to the end of our show today and the questions well, continue. we can talk about the fee <laughs> continue to come in you i know you you have a good heart you want to bless the world <laughs> and leave a great legacy so this is your opportunity uh folks i again I, I cannot tell you how much um joe was just a, a friend and a mentor and a support and helped me tremendously in my career so it's just a thrill for You're me to be here and talk to you and to reminisce really <laughs> right. going back and by the way he looks fabulous <laughs> You know, retirement agrees with you. I'm only 22 years old, by the way. <laughs> retirement does agree with you. And Carol, whatever you're doing, it's working. It's working uh, with Joe. Okay, a couple more questions maybe, and then we'll call it a day. Um, what are the top three tips that you have for an aspiring CEO? Um, well, uh, I, I think the first thing is to realize it's not really all about you. Um, you, you, any individual is not going to be successful unless they have hopefully put even smarter people around them. I mean, you're as good as your team. And I think people who think it's all about them are about to hit a wall. Um, I think you need to figure out a way to take care of yourself because it is a hard journey. Um, it is a 24 seven job and it really is 24 seven. You're, you're never, even when you're on vacation, you're never really off because there's an expectation that you're going to be available. And, and I think the last thing is to, is to enjoy it, en enjoy the ride. I mean, it's, it, you know, cause it'll be over pretty quick. Every, every person who becomes a CEO is imminently replaceable. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I used to say that uh, I was a temporary occupant of a seat mm -hmm. and, and uh, the idea is to make it better while you're there and hopefully whoever takes over for you is going to make it even better than you did. That's that because that sustains the organization. That that's what the job is really about. That is really a good point of reflection, a great perspective. You are just a temporary occupant of mm -hmm. a seat. Right. Don't I don't believe in your own invincibility. Nobody is, you know. Um, 
indispensable. Right. Okay, we'll take one last question and then Joe, we're gonna wrap up. But on the promise <laughs> that he will, will bring him back, uh, he's gonna come back. I don't know how, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you have questions to answer, so you are. Sure, I'll be happy. You'll be happy to come back. back. Okay. You, the last question that we can take today is: How did you make the transition from corporate life to retirement? How do you invest your time now? Oh well, I was ready to retire. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe I had pulled it off in the first place to become CEO. So after seven years, I was ready to go. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I love my life now. I love just being dad and husband and grandpa and and uh, I, 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 I stay busy. I'm one, I'm one two corporate boards. In fact, I'm going to Utah tomorrow morning. I'll be heading out to the Dominion meeting. Uh, so there's plenty to do, but more than anything, I just, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this. I spent 37 years in an office. I try to get outside as much as I can. I'm serious, to get outside, to smell the air, to, to just kind of reflect on the blessings of your life. And, and uh, so uh, my, my days uh, are, I feel extraordinarily blessed. And I, and I feel blessed to have spent this time with you. Thank you. And by the way, guys, he's not joking. One time I called him, he was sitting by the sea. I could literally hear the waves at the, at the, in the back. And so he is, again, it's doing very well for you. Retirement has worked very well, and I'm glad that you're able to enjoy it. Did, are you, do you like working around the house and doing oh, I'm, things, I'm, fixing I'm actually, things? I'm actually very handy. Yes. I do all the ironing. I do all the vacuuming. Um, I push the car when we go food shopping. So I, 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 I stay fully, fully engaged. Carol, good job <laughs> in putting him to work yeah. at home. <laughs> so everyone, if you're joining us now, we're just wrapping up our conversation with Joe Rigby, retired, chairman of the board, president, and chief executive officer of Pepco Holdings, Inc. Joe led our company through tremendous times and was a leader that was strong, that was visionary, and that we stood tremendous, tremendous um, attacks um, against the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I ended up one of the times um, when we were the most hated company and got all those comments from, the, uh, from employees. You took accountability and made the executives work through it and resolve it. And for that, I respect you. Well, thank Folks, you. you're going to have Joe back. He's promised to come <laughs> back whenever we want to have him. And again, if you're joining us right now, this is The Grace Talk. Thank you for being a part of our show today. Good night, and God bless you.